This year as a congregation, the leadership, myself and the elders have decided that one of the best ways that we can help you to grow in your faith, to grow in your knowledge of the Word of God, and to apply that knowledge of the Word of God is to challenge you to live your life 100% by the Bible. So far as we have looked at this topic, we have seen what the world views about it, mostly confusion, maybe a little bit of apprehension, maybe even a little bit of fear as we look at this concept of living our lives 100% by the Bible. We've also looked at what the Scriptures say. What does the Bible say about the concept of us living our lives 100% by the Bible? Well, the last couple of weeks we've seen that indeed we should be living our lives 100% by the Bible. Now, this week is a continuation of last week's study, which is how do we study the Bible? How do we come to the Bible and to understand what it says and to apply it honestly? How do we apply it without cherry-picking? Because that's probably one of the worst um, accusations you can receive. Well, you're just cherry-picking. You have a theology. You have something that you want to do. So you're going through and you're cherry-picking these passages so that you can feel better about yourself, so you can look down upon others. You're not taking the Bible as a whole. You're not being honest about it. And that's what the world really accuses us of. So last week, we began to unpack some principles that I believe were overlooked by A.J. Jacobs and some others as they have sought to live their lives 100% by the Bible, as we, as a congregation this year, seek to live our lives by the Bible. So what are some of these principles that we looked at last week? Well, we looked at the fact that the Bible is 100% inspired of God. It is breathed out by God Himself, and it is delivered to us, preserved for us, in exactly the way that God wants it preserved and delivered to us. Now, that being said, we need to understand that the Bible from cover to cover tells a single story. It tells one unified story. This book tells one story, and that's about God intervention within the affairs of men. And despite the fact that it tells one story from cover to cover, we also need to understand that it contains over 66 books, and each one of these books contains different types of literature. And if we're going to be honest about how we approach the Bible, we need to understand those liter literatures, those different types of literature. We need to understand how to approach these different types of writing styles. We also need to understand and seek to understand the original intent of the author. To take the Bible literally, quite frankly, is a little ridiculous. Now, that doesn't mean we don't accept the entire Bible. The entire Bible is true. The entire Bible is for us. But we don't take everything literally, just like you wouldn't take everything literally in the news. If the newscaster said it's raining cats and dogs out here, you're not literally running outside to get yourself a little puppy right? You don't, you, you, you take him literally, right? He's literally saying it's raining cats and dogs, but it's not like there's actual cats and dogs falling from the sky. We understand this type of speech. The same thing exists within Scripture, and to be honest about it, and honest about the literature that's here is the best approach to Scripture. Now, it's one thing to lay out these principles. It's another thing to apply them. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do this morning, is to take and apply these passages. Now, there's a lot of directions we could go with this. There's a lot of different information we could cover. So, because we're Americans and we all like food, I thought we'd answer the question, what does God want you to eat? Now, some of you are like, man, I should have stayed home this morning. He's going to tell me to do something I don't want to do. But that's one of the challenges of living our life biblically. We come to the pages of Scripture, and we honestly want to know what God asks us to do. And if that means we need to change our diet, then we need to change our diet. So what does, scriptures, what does the Scripture have to say? Look over in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 29, because God does address this topic. He says, Behold, I give you every plant yielding seed, that is on the face of the earth, every tree with the seed of its fruit. You shall have them for food. Every beast of the, on the earth, and every bird in the heavens, and everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. 
So in the beginning, when God created mankind, when God created all living creatures, He gives them as their diet vegetables. And there's a bunch of you who are going, yep, I should have stayed home today. Ignorance was bliss. Where's my meat? But this isn't the only thing that Scripture says about our diet. This is a starting point, but this is not the whole story. Look over at Genesis chapter 9. And in Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 2, God speaking to Noah and his family says, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast on the earth and every bird in the heavens and upon everything that creeps upon the ground and the fish in the sea. And into your hands they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be your food. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat its flesh that has life in it. That is, it's blood. So God gives us meat to eat. Now, is this a contradiction? On one hand, the Bible says you're only supposed to eat vegetables. And then over here, we have this passage that says, well, you need to eat meat. You can eat meat. Which is it? It's not a contradiction. We have to understand that God is revealing His will to humanity throughout time. We need to understand where these passages come into play and why they come into play. So it's not a contradiction. It's a proper understanding of Scripture. To take every passage literally, to say, well, I came to this passage and it says I can only eat vegetables. And then to come over here to this other passage and say, well, you can eat meat. Which is it? What's both? If you existed before the flood, you were only to eat vegetables. That was your diet. After the flood, you can eat meat. Simple as that. Now, God does give one stipulation still. He says you're not to eat the life force of the animal or the blood. Now, some of you may go, okay, Michael, scientifically, that's not accurate. We know that there's not actually life force within the blood. It's just, okay, fair enough. But understand what God is saying here, right? There's something about the blood that God doesn't want us to eat. We may not understand all the reasons why, but we need to respect and honor that because God knows best, right? Right? The other thing is anybody who has lost a significant amount of blood knows that if you lose blood, you get very weak. If you lose enough blood, you do die. So in a very real sense, the life force is in the blood. And for whatever reason, God says the best practice is not to eat its blood. Don't strangle the animal to try to keep the blood in the meat. Drain the blood out of the meat. And that's still a practice, a modern practice today, right? So avoid your blood puddings, right? Drain your meats properly. Preserve them well. Cook them well. That's what God is saying. Now, what is this whole thing then, biblically speaking, around kosher food? Right? Because I I know there's more stipulations, Michael, than simply eat and enjoy. Right? God, God gives more instructions about this. So what is this issue of kosher food? Well, turn over to Leviticus chapter 11, and let's kind of get an overview of the kosher diet. Starting in verse 11, Moses, speaking to the people of Israel for God, says, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Nevertheless, among these that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shall not eat these, the camel, Because it chews the cud, but it does not have a split hoof. It is unclean to you. God will go on there to explain that this kosher diet that we refer to, or this Jewish diet that God is giving to the nation of Israel, that it has to both have the split and hoof, and it also has to chew the cud. And if it doesn't do both, then it's unclean. Right? So God goes on to explain some of this. He then says anything that swims... It has to have fins, and it have to ha- has to have scales. In addition to that, he talks about those things that fly. And if it is a bird of prey, it's off limits. Now, the question we need to ask is why? And the question we need to ask is, does this apply to us? Well, why does God give us these stipulations? Why, why does God give the Jewish nation these stipulations for their uh, dietary laws? Well, let's look down a few passages further to verse 24. In verse 24 and 25, 
God says there in chapter 11. And these you shall, shall become un... I'm going to start over. And by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcasses shall become unclean until evening. And whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash their clothes and become, un- become unclean until evening. Now jump down to verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy as I am holy. You shall not defile yourself with anything that swarms or crawls upon the ground. So God gives us a stipulation for why he gives these dietary laws. He is setting apart or making holy the nation of Israel. While everybody around them is eating pork, they're not even to have it in their area, in their borders. The purpose of the Jewish laws, the Mosaic law, was to set the people apart from their nations around them. Everything in their life, in their devotion to God, was dictated to them by their book. Every aspect of their life, what they ate, what they drank, how they, what they wore, how they acted, how they worshipped, was told to them. There was not an aspect of their devotion to God that was not affected in their life. It affected everything. And God gave them these dietary laws, first and foremost, to set them apart. For them to be a little bit different from their neighbors. They were to stand out from the crowd. It was to be obvious that they were a Jew. That they were the people of God. That is why he gave them these laws. Now in addition to that, as people have studied these laws, one of the things that they found is they're just, they're just, it's just wise. right? To avoid pork when you don't have refrigeration is just wise because of the diseases that can be carried by the swine, right? So it's protecting them. Now that is a secondary reason for God's giving of some of these laws. So as we come to the Old Testament, we can find some things that is wise for us, that is, can give us wisdom about how to live. We might not understand why God said, don't mix your fabrics, but he had a reason. It may just be that he wanted to set the people apart. There might actually be some health benefits to it. We don't know. But God said, do it. So the Jews did it. So the next question we need to ask is, does this apply to us today? Does this apply to us today? Is this something that we should be following? Should we be following these practices of kosher law? Let's let Jesus answer that question. Turn over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 14. And Jesus called them, called the people to him again and said, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, are you still without understanding? Do you still not see what is going that do you still not see that whatever goes in to a person cannot defile him since it enters in it enters not into his heart but into his stomach and then it is expelled. Thus he declares all food clean. And he said, when it what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within him out of his heart of the man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, slander, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they are what defile a man. Mark tells us that Jesus, by teaching this, declares all foods clean. He interjects. As he's writing to his audience, he says, okay, time out. What Jesus means by this is he declares all food clean. And then he goes back to the story. What Jesus is talking about here is this concept of ritual purity. In order to enter the presence of God, in order to set yourself apart for the devotion of God, in obedience to Him, you follow these ritual practices. But Jesus says, you do understand that these are a ritual purity, not an inward purity. What really defiles you, what really is sin, is not what you eat, it's what's coming out of your heart. That's what defiles a person. Not what goes into his mouth. That then is expelled. 
that then is expelled. It's what comes out of his heart. That's what defines whether he's clean or unclean. Don't go waltzing into the temple worrying about what you've eaten. Worry about what's in your heart and what you're acting like. That's what Jesus is teaching here. And by doing this, Jesus declares all food clean. Now this is something that was really hard for the early church. Turn over to Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter has to really wrestle with this concept. We're going to start our reading in verse 9. The next day, as they were on a journey approaching the city, Peter was on top of the house about the sixth hour in prayer. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending and being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals, reptiles, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have not eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and then it was taken up into heaven. Now, at that very moment, there's a knock at the door. And Peter is called upon by Gentiles to go with them. So the next day they go, jump down to verse 28. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit with anyone of another nation. But God has shown to me that I must not call any person common or unclean. So why have you sent for me? So I came without so when you sent for me, I came without objections. I ask why you sent for me. So then Cornelius begins to explain to him why he was sent for. It's important for us to understand that at that time the church was 100% Jewish. There were no Gentiles. They had slowly allowed some of the Samaritans to enter in, some people who were on the fringes of Jewish society, but it had stayed within the Jewish religion and within the, the Jewish people group. That's where, what the church existed in for the first several years of its existence. So God has to send a vision to Peter of these unclean animals, telling him, get up, kill and eat, enjoy. And every time, for three times, Peter responds, I will not. I have never eaten anything unclean or or common. I've never eaten any of those foods. I will not. And God affirming three times, do not call what I have called clean, unclean. And then there's the knock at the door. Peter understands that he should not raise an objection. So he goes. He goes into the house of Gentiles. A place that he was forbidden by the law to go. To associate with them. To eat with them. And while he was there, these, Gentile Christ, or these Gentiles received the Holy Spirit like on the day of Pentecost. God in a wondrous sign proves to the Jews that had come with Peter... That this is of God. And he then turns to his associates and says, Can anyone prevent these Gentiles from being brought into the family of God? Can we prevent them from being baptized? And of course, they couldn't object. We know this was a problem. And we know that this sign happened to allow the Gentiles in because of what happens in chapter 11. Turn over there, starting in verse 2. So when Peter went back up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men, and you ate with them. But Peter began to explain to them in order. I had this vision. We went and we preached. There was an angel that went to Cornelius that set all this in motion. Then the Holy Spirit was poured out. How could we prevent them from being brought into the family of God? Down jump down to verse 18. And when they heard these things, they fell silent. They glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And aren't we grateful for that? But understand that it took all of these signs. An angel coming to Cornelius. God showing a vision three times to Peter. And then the Holy Spirit falling upon these Gentiles. To allow them to enter into the church. Because it was so set in their mind that they needed to follow the law still. God begins to peel this concept back. He begins to work upon their hearts. 
Now we see that this concept comes not only to the accepting of us as Gentiles into the church, but it also extends to all Jewish law, all the Mosaic law, in what we see in passages like Colossians chapter 2. Turn over there. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to start there in verse 16. If I can find the right, there we go. Colossians 2, starting in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or in regards to festivals and new moons or Sabbaths. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul says in his writing that the substance of the law is found in Christ. That these Old Testament laws that were a shadow no longer apply. Look over at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 starting in verse 3. Paul says, Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected when received with thanksgiving. So it's very clear that the teaching around the Levitical law passed away once the church was established. Now, it was a hard transition for the Jews, but they began to understand it. And the reason for this is that the concept of being set apart and sanctified by your outward actions ended. It was a sign, it was a tutor that led them to this point. We see that if we want to establish doctrine, if we want to establish what we need to apply to our life, we go to the New Testament. We don't go to the Old Testament to establish doctrine. We don't go to the Old Testament to establish what we should do and how we should live our life. We go to the New Testament. We take the whole Bible to come to an understanding like this. And that's an honest way, a respectable way to come to the text. Now, one of the questions we then need to ask is, why on earth is, do we even have the Old Testaments in our Bible then? If we need to come just to the New Testament to establish doctrine, if we need to come to the New Testament to establish how we ought to live our life, why do we even have it? Why for the past year have I spent so much time in the Old Testament if this truth is indeed a truth? Turn over to Galatians. We've studied this book recently, but I think there's much that we can still glean from it and we need to be reminded. Galatians 3, starting in verse 24, Paul says... So then the law was a guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus." And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings and heirs according to that promise. Paul says if you want to understand the purpose of the law, if you want to have a proper view of the law, you view it like a teacher. You view it like a tutor. Somebody who was there to teach you, somebody who was there to train you up, to show you what was right and what was wrong. And it leads you to Christ. It leads you to the New Testament. It's a wonderfully laid out story. From beginning to end, the Old Testament is, but it has no ending. It doesn't have the fulfillment. It, it ends waiting for the Messiah, waiting for God's nation to be reestablished. And the New Testament is that continuation, the answer to that question. Look over at Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law was but a shadow of the good things that were to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continued, continually offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. We're going to be studying this next Wednesday night and following the rest of the book of Hebrews. I encourage you to come because it answers this question. If you wrestle with this, come to the class. I love what was said this last Wednesday night. The law was the negative. It was the negative. The New Testament is the reality, the full color photo. Now there's something interesting about negatives. 
negatives will draw out things that you may not have noticed in the full color image. And the full color image will draw out things that you didn't notice in the negative. You need both. Now obviously we normally go to the color image. But the negative has a purpose. The negative has a point. So when we come to the pages of the Old Testament, we can still learn a great deal about the nature of God, about who God is, about how we ought to live our life. But we have to make sure we can bring that into the New Testament age. And that's an important skill to have. Now, like I said, when the church began, it was fully Jewish. They still followed the law. They understood that Christ was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system, but they still went to synagogue. They still read the Old Testament. They still studied the words of God. They still held it in high honor, as we should. But they wrestled with what applied to a Christian and what didn't. How, did, how do we accept these new Gentiles who were coming into the church? That was a big problem. So the church dealt with the question very clearly not trying to contradict things, not throwing out things that they just didn't like. They wanted to honestly answer the question, how do we not cherry pick and what applies to us today? As we enter into a new covenant, what applies to me today? So we turn to the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. And in Acts 15, starting in, let's see here, verse 1 and 2, we get the setting. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the mo custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small, small discussion and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders to ask about this question. This is a big debate. Do we circumcise or do we not? How much of the Old Testament law do we follow? That's the big question. Well, let's go up to the apostles that are in Jerusalem. Let's go up to the elders in Jerusalem. Let's ask them this question. We're just a small church in Antioch. We can't answer this question fully. Paul and Barnabas have an opinion. These other people have an opinion. Let's go to the apostles. What do we do today? We go to the Word of God. We go to their writings, the New Testament. What do they say about it? So what did the apostles and the elders decide. Jump over to verse 6. And the apostles and the elders were, were gathered together to consider this matter. And after they had been much debate, Peter stood up among them. And he said, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke on the necks of the disciples that neither nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and justified by His will. So Paul stands up and makes this argument. Why are we going to lay upon the yoke or the necks of these Gentile Christians or upon the church as a whole a yoke that neither our fathers nor us have been able to bear? This Old Testament law. Why would we require that upon these new Christians? Do we not believe, brethren, that we are justified by faith in Christ? So James speaks up in verse 19. He says, Therefore, it is my judgment that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God, but we should write to them to abstain from things that are polluted from idols, from sexual immorality, and from things that have been strangled and its blood. From, for from ancient generations, Moses has been in every city and those who proclaim him. For he is read in every synagogue every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders and with the whole church to choose from men among them to send them to Antioch. So we see here in the Jerusalem council that the apostles, 
and the elders and the whole church in Jerusalem agreed that what is required upon the Gentile Christians, and I would say upon the Jewish Christians as well, is simply these three requirements. You to abstain from idol worship, you are to abstain from sexual immorality, and you are to abstain from food that has been strangled with its blood in it, which goes all the way back to Genesis. These three requirements. Now, you might be able to argue that maybe some of these don't apply as much. You might go to Romans chapter 14 and 15 and say, well, there's this whole thing about meat sacrifice to idols, and is that acceptable, yada, yada, yada. We cannot make an argument that we should require any more of the Old Testament law than what the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem dictate here. You might be able to argue less, but you cannot argue more. The elders and the apostles met upon this, talked about this, and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, this is what is required. And for us as Christians... For us to approach the scriptures and to say, well, we should approach and try to follow the hundreds of obscure laws in the Old Testament if we're going to live biblically is dishonest. And it's not honest to the text. There's a lot of ways that we could have approached the text today. There's a lot of questions we could have asked. Maybe there was a better way. I don't know. But I hope it's become clear to you how you should approach scripture how we should come to the Scriptures to seek to live our lives 100% by it. Because we don't want to cherry pick. If this is indeed the Word of God, delivered to us to show us how to live, then we would be foolish to reject it and say, I know better. We would be foolish to not try to live our life 100% by it. But we'd be just as foolish to not understand the whole Bible within its context to take take something from a covenant that we are no longer under and try to apply it to our lives today. We need to understand what passes that bridge. Why was that given originally? These are important things for us to consider. So how do we study our Bible? Well, we keep in mind that it is inspired of God. It doesn't contradict itself. It's delivered to us just as God wanted it to be. It contains one single story from beginning to end, And yet it contains multiple books that need to be understood within their context and the literature that is written therein. And it is foolish for us to try to take everything literally. You end up with some weird lady with the Tower of David as her neck and literal teeth made of sheep. We obviously don't read everything literally. We seek to understand it within its context. We seek to understand why it was written. We seek to understand the intent of the writers. And we have to understand where it's placed in the overall story of the Scriptures. Was it written in the church age in which we live? Is it something that instructs us about the nature of God and His will in the Old Testament? And we need to question whether or not we bring that across the bridge. Or is it something that is revealed to us about the patriarchal period, about what is sin and what is not? And if we find something that is in all three covenants, we better take att- pay attention to it. These are some ways that we cannot cherry pick from Scripture. We can be honest as we approach the Bible. We see the Old Testament as a tutor, something that teaches us about the nature of God, about His will. But understand that not everything applies to us because some of it was written to make the Jewish nation stand out. It was Jewish laws written to a Jewish nation for a period of time. And those don't apply in the church today. And that's not dishonest. It's dishonest to say the opposite. We come to the New Testament to establish doctrine. We come to the New Testament to establish how we ought to live our lives. That's honesty. That's a correct approach to Scripture. It's a little bit complicated, but not everything in this book is simple. Yes, a child can understand it, but theologians have drowned in its pages. This is a complex book that will require much of you. So as we seek to become people who live 100% by the Bible, I hope you will ask hard questions. I hope you'll wrestle with the text. 
I hope that you will study it and that you'll come to your brothers and sisters and to me and to the elders and say, I don't understand this, help me. But I hope that you'll come to the pages of Scripture and say, whatever it asks me to do, I will do, so long as it is true. That's what we believe about the Bible. And anyone who seeks to do otherwise, in my opinion, is foolish. And I hope that you will seek to live your life by the Bible, 100%.